Now you might not think it to look at this old MOD shed, but inside this building is $20 million worth of Formula One cars. My goal is to get my hands on the merchandise. This is James Densley, the technical director of TDF. Um, James, thank you for like, letting me in here because there's a lot of secrets in here and uh, I'm not used to seeing Formula One cars without their clothes on because they, they keep them covered for a reason. So you've got a room full of trade secrets and it's amazing you get to get hands on this stuff and dive into the detail of how these cars were actually made originally. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, we're trying to sort of break the mold a little bit with, uh, with trying to get people around them. As you say, they're normally covered and people can't see them. So. Yeah. If we can get people around them and get them back on circuit, most importantly, that's what we're sort of trying to do. It's mega. I mean, one thing I noticed in this room, you've got, I mean, a serious collection across a you know, range of different years, but nearly everything in here is a V10. It's yeah. the golden era of F1. It's the, it's the days that people long for, 18,000 RPM, you know, unbelievable technology that went into the engines that power these things and that made your ears bleed. One thing I, I sort of thought about, you've got so many different you know, manufacturers, different teams' kits, and nothing fits. You know, like if you, get, if, you make, if, you miss, if you mix up a bolt for the Jordan and try and put it in the, you know, the Williams, there's gonna be a problem, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely, that's the biggest headache we have, but that's why we've got the precision department. Okay. So we can scan everything, reverse engineer everything, and we do all our design and manufacture and CAD work and everything in-house. Um, from 3D printing all the way through to final parts. So we can kind of control that a little yeah. bit, but the time frame is obviously a bit longer. But yeah, as you say, they're all very individual. So the big problem you would have, I guess, is, um, well, you just mentioned you have to reverse engineer stuff, which presumably means you run out of bits, so you can't, you can't just buy some more from Williams. Yeah. But also some of these cars, I presume, some of the sequence are removed. You don't, I mean, I wouldn't think, they spend all this money. Yeah. It's a huge arms race during the winter and during the season to out-engineer the other teams, keep everything under wraps, fake side pods, yeah. all these games that you see. And then I, I just find it remarkable that at the end of the season, these cars get sold mm. and then you've got them and you can open them up and, and see what's inside. But they must hide some stuff. Yeah, I mean, generally they'll use them as show cars for a couple of years and there's a, there's a reg that you can't run anything within five years of like a current car. Yeah. The teams can, but they tend not to sort of creep out until three or four years after. Um, but then when they come out, occasionally you'll get one that's got a little bit more in there. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you'll get them come out with just a frame on the back, no radiators, no internals, and we just literally get a rolling bare, bare car. Right. Um, and then depending on the client, depends on how far we've got. Gearboxes? Go. Uh, gearboxes generally will come with them just because it's an easy way for them to hang rear suspension on. Yeah. But this one, for instance, completely empty when it turned up to us as it is here. Right. Um, we've designed all the internals, they've all been manufactured, uh, and this is going away for coating, and then all the internals will be back in that. January yeah. next year, um, and then we can get the rest of this car back together then. For the casing, this definitely looks vintage, yep, so it's it original. Yep. Um, so this is Villeneuve's car from 97, is yep. that right? Uh, 98. 98, sorry, yep. 98. Is, yeah, 98. Um, so this is a year after you won the championship. So yep. this is the Williams, there was the last Williams to carry the number one. It is, yeah. So it's a pretty special car, so 1998. I, I, just, I remember the livery I found really striking back in the day, it just looked, it really sort of leapt out at you. But it was kind of the beginning of the decline of Williams, wasn't it? So Adrian Newey had left the year before. Yeah. Um, so the 97 car was the last Newey car at Williams. Yeah. And then Renault pulled out at the end of that year. So this is a Mecha, or was a so Mecha was Chrome a engine Mecha Chrome. in yeah. this car. Yeah, and the, like you say, the livery changed, the Rothmans thing went. It was all quite a like, turbulent period, I guess, for Williams at that yeah. time. So if you've been inspired by all the talk about loud engines and you want to buy something sporty for yourself, you want to make sure it doesn't come with a bad history or it's been crashed or stolen or something even worse. The best thing to use for your next car purchase is Car Vertical, who are the sponsors of this video. So by punching in the reg or the VIN number of the car you're about to buy, Car Vertical will give you a full report so you can take a thorough look at the history of the car you're about to buy to make sure you're not buying a lemon. So let's say you want to get hold of a racy Honda with some serious downforce and you come across something like this Honda Civic Type R. Looks like it could be pretty sweet. You punch in its reg or VIN number into Car Vertical and you get the full report and ooh dear me. It's been crashed twice. It's been written off by the insurers and there's some devastating photos here with all the airbags have gone off and it's looking in a very, very sorry state. It's not a car you want to buy. So to make sure you don't buy a car with a dodgy history like this one, use Car Vertical, use my exclusive link in the description below or use my discount code BCD to get 10% off when you use Car Vertical and thanks to those guys for sponsoring my video. This car saw some serious action. Yeah. So is this 
the car that he crashed at Eau Rouge. Uh, yeah, it is. That's where it finished its like racing life. It did most of the first half of the year. Yeah. Had a podium at Monaco, I believe. Uh, maybe at Hockenheim as well. Um, and then, yeah, it finished backwards in the fence at Eau Rouge. Jacques Villeneuve is no stranger to big accidents. Last year in Belgium, driving for Williams, the Canadian had a huge off at Eau Rouge. Although his car left the circuit at a tremendous rate of knots, Jacques was quite calm and collected about the whole incident. That's Villeneuve, 110% commitment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So engine-wise, so this is not this is not a Mechachrome, is it? So right. did a lot of those get destroyed or yeah, just Renault, lost? Yeah, Renault are renowned for it anyway, as our Honda, but for destroying the engines at the end of the year. Um, and then obviously they went destroyed into Mechachrome. Destroyed to prevent their designs being shown and seen? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, all the IP, especially with the valves, because that was where they were trying to get the revs from. Um, and the, the competition at that time for getting more revs, more power, yeah. was you know, rife with all the teams. So Renault were quite good for it. And then of course, when they pulled out, Mechachrome took over, then it became super tech and they sort of got handed on and handed on. And yeah, they weren't in a very good state really at the end. So with the V10s, the arms race was to get more revolutions to increase the horsepower, wasn't it? So yeah. these ran around 800 horsepower? Something yeah, something like that. Like that. Um, and more revs meant the valves had to do more. And the way to speed them up without them flying to pieces was air management, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, they all run on an air, on an air valve system. This, this engine that's in this car is a Judd, yeah. uh, brand new. Um, couple of reasons. One, it fitted the parameters that the owner wanted, um, and two, we can get bits for it. Um, yeah. And we do have a super tech for this, but it's, uh, it would need remanufacturing from the inside out, yeah. and the cost on that is hugely prohibitive. So I'm familiar with the Judd, because we used, we used it in the, in the Le Mans car when I was racing yeah. 01 and 02 in the Ascari. Yeah. And, um, and like that, you know, it's carbon shell, monocoque, Everything from tip to toe is is a stressed component, mm -hmm. so that you know it all goes through. You know all that stress gets channeled through the engine, which is pretty amazing. So it's got to do the work of powering the car, and all that all the g-force that's twisting the chassis. It's yeah. pretty amazing what what these things can put up with. Yeah, absolutely. And we were lucky with it. Oh, you know, we do a lot of work and research, but ultimately the engine is only four millimeters longer than the original Renault. Yeah. Um, and because of the spacer plate that adapts to the gearbox that was an original Williams component anyway, yeah. uh, we were able to just adjust in there and then we've adjusted the slave cylinder inside for the clutch. So in terms of getting it back in, it wasn't too difficult for us. Okay. Which was, it's nice when it works out that way. So you're clutching the steering wheels. Is that actually Villeneuve's wheel? It is. It's the original. So that's the original wheel that was, uh, was Jacques. He had a really right. weird um, setup. So he's done the same in this and there's another car that we've got of his as well. So he had a clutch on one side so on the left. clutch there, yeah. And then he was up and down on one paddle. So he pushed and pulled, which I think is bizarre. That is weird. So I'm used to having, you know, go faster, go slower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it, so he used to push away. It's strange that because, you know, you're fingers are stronger at pulling than they are pull it pushing away. Yeah. I would have thought that would have been quite, quite a weird sensation actually, yeah. so going forwards and pushing away. Especially if you were steering with lock, you, you get used to what you're, you, yeah. know, and you know more than anyone, like you get used to what you're doing, like that muscle memory. Yeah. So his must have been quite weird. So I don't really know where that came from, because obviously all the early cars, when they came into paddles, were all up and down as standard. But Jacques is quite, qu he's quirky, isn't he? Yeah. So he has um, his big baggy suits, um, blonde hair, pretty cavalier attitude, but also incredibly quick, incredibly t talented guy. Yeah, um, I, it, it might well have just been that it was just different, so he wanted to do it. Yeah, <laughs> pretty amazing, because he had a, you know incredible start at Formula One. He's one of only three drivers to put the car in pole position in his rookie race in yes. Australia. No, First time it. out, it's just incredible. So, the other thing that's fascinating me about this era is um, the move away from, you know, this, well, how the suspension developed and these um, torsion bars mm. that control the weight transfer and the, and the absorption of the forces. Yeah. Could you explain how these work? Because I've never raced a car that had these because it's quite an unusual configuration, isn't it? Okay, yeah. So, I mean, they've changed along the way. The sort of early 90s cars were all torsion bars driven through the tops. They still work the same way. There's a, a rocker and it's fixed at one end and the torsion bar that goes through is splined at both ends. Yeah. So when you see the force here, it twists the bar and instead of using a, a spring like you would conventionally, it uses the twist in the bar. Cool. Um, and then there are, our dampers are away at the moment at Rebuild, but there's then a, what is literally just a damper, no spring on and that's just used to control that rate so they don't resonate when they come off in the same way a spring would. So I've heard a rumor that on um, the current Red Bull, Verstappen's car, mm -hmm. they don't have a torsion bar and that the wishbones are the stressed component for rolled control yeah. and they're linked in the middle. Yeah. Have you heard this? It, yeah, I Is have. It, uh, does anyone know this for a fact? Does someone has managed to get a spy shot of it? I or mean, that? I'm sure the other teams know. Um, from what, what I think or what I've heard that, yeah, they're, they're doing some really clever stuff with the way they're controlling the, f f the ride height in the car, okay. especially at the front end. Um, but yeah, without seeing it or knowing it. 
Well, it looks pretty good. For a car that's been in the wall 180 miles an hour at Eau Rouge, more <laughs> yeah. on that later, yeah, um, yeah. it looks pretty tidy. But, um, but this was Villeneuve's departure to BAR after this. Yes, it was, yeah. So when you've got one of his cars over there, but yep. I have to look at this, because this is what, 04 button car? It is, yeah, 04 BAR Honda. One of the fastest cars ever. I mean, it only got yeah. surpassed in, what, 2021? Yeah, 20, 20 or 21. I can't remember which year they shifted the regs there, but yeah, it's... Um, the 04 cars were the fastest in history up yeah. until that point, and this, this car did all but one Grand Prix uh, with Jensen in, and he finished runner-up to Michael in the championship. Mega, so, so this is a really, I mean, this is a proper pit of kit. Yeah, it's a special car, this one. So what matches? So you've got the tub. I <laughs> yeah. think you were hinting to me earlier that this is a bit of a rat rod. Yeah, it's, so it's you've got a, a few mixed components it's on It's a bit here. of a bit of this one. So the brief, brief from the client was to be all F1 components uh, and as original as possible, but knowing the restrictions that there wasn't a gearbox for it from Honda, yeah. Honda destroyed all the engines. Um, and when this turned up to us, it was just a rolling shell, essentially. Yeah. There's two of them. Uh, one of them was hanging in the wind tunnel at uh -huh. my old place of work. So we pulled that one out because that was the one that had the, the results in. And yeah. the other one was the first car I bought. But yeah, so the engine is a 2002-2003 Cosworth. Mm -hmm. Um, again, pulling all the revs and the gearboxes is a 2005 Minardi gearbox, actually. Right. So it's all original F1 componentry. It's all working in the same way. It makes all the right noises and bells and whistles, all in hydraulics, but it's... Um, but different. But yeah, it's not the original running gear for the car. But close enough, because the, the, the bulk of it's there. And yes. these two are really they're good size. They're quite spacious inside. I mean, I'd fit in quite nicely. Yeah, absolutely. So I've talked to you about that as well. Yeah, yeah. Keen to <laughs> try one. That's cool. So the 95 Jordan, I recognise that name, Barrichello is that guy yeah. who, um, he's pretty rude actually, he made a t-shirt saying that he beat my time at the Top Gear track, I'm, so I'm not sure, I think, but I remember that he'd widened the track to do this, so I think that's oh, really? cheating. That, well, that's got to be, isn't it? But anyway, yeah, I'll probably need to go back that. and um, try and restore some honour about that, but <laughs> Barrichello is always a huge fan of him, and when I was racing in Formula 3, I, was, I used to watch these um, old videos to try and learn as much as you could from the yeah. history of, of the sport and everything. And he was this you know, incredibly fast driver. He was always on pole position and he nearly always stalled it and screwed up the start. Really? <laughs> and he would go to the back and fight through. And, and you had Coulthard was his main rival who qualified badly all the time. And was, so they were both just sort of hopping up and down the grid all the time. But it made it a really interesting season. But in Formula One, you know, he was a fantastic driver. And mm. this Jordan's a pretty car, isn't it? So this is, this is completely original, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's running with the Peugeot. Again, yeah. the gearbox came empty and we've had to remake all the internals for the gearbox. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this car is running pretty much original. The only thing we've changed is we've taken the hydraulic systems out and put pneumatic systems in because they're the big control element that yeah. is really costly and really time, you know, sucks all the time away when you go running. Um, so we, we go into pneumatics to look after the gear control. Yeah. Um, so this is that era that was soon after the, when they banned traction control. Yeah. But you've, you've had um, Schumacher's 94 Benetton in, haven't you? Yes, yeah. So everybody was always keen and curious at whether they were running traction. Yeah. But did you have it long enough to sort of get it apart and have a proper look at the electrics and see if, they, if, they, if it had snuck some traction control through? We, if we'd have had more time with it or, you know, it wasn't here to do a large amount of work, so we couldn't pull it apart. But you found something on the steering wheel. Well, so they had this, rumoured to have had this, I think it was like mode 13 or something, which was uh, seeming to be launch control. Mm -hmm. um, and it had a clutch pedal in, but it was also connected to a hydraulic valve, which is unusual because normally you just clutch to a slave cylinder yeah. and it, you, know, you do it on your foot. Um, so to have it there, having an electronic piece of control in there was unusual. But again, we never got a chance okay. to run it and see whether it actually did anything so or not. So potentially you could, you could use the tune on the, uh, with the electric gizmo to yeah. um, meet out the, the clutch and try yeah. and achieve a perfect start. Yeah, just step off the clutch and let them <clears> move, <throat> move to the rest. Do the rest. Hearsay. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So this is the car that Villeneuve went to, so BAR. So he tried to do a Schumacher, didn't he? Um, create his own team, and this was the first car with a split livery, which was really striking. No one had ever done that before, and yeah. it looked, I mean, it looked beautiful, but I, remember, I can always remember all the footage I've seen of this car, it looks dangerous, even in a straight line. It, it, moving around really awkwardly, it, it looked unstable. It was year one, wasn't it? You know, it's, you know, any new team coming in is really up against it when you're up against some of the big teams, big yeah. manufacturers. Um, you know, and I think 
they were trying some things that maybe weren't as conventional or trying to reinvent the wheel a little bit, which yeah. normally doesn't always help. Um, well, the wheels fell off, didn't they? Uh, yeah, yeah, and they had some big shunts. <laughs> yeah, massive. Um, because is this the this is Zonta's car, isn't it? Yeah. So they um, that was a, again back to uh, Spa. Yeah. Eau Rouge, he crashed that at yeah. high speed, and then got in this, and he had a bet going with Zonta, wasn't it? To, um, they were going to do it on their first lap, try and take it flat. flat. Both drivers would attempt the daunting corner without lifting, and the result was almost a carbon copy of last year's accident. One car down, Craig Pollock was concerned. When the session restarted, Ricardo Zonta went straight out. The Brazilian didn't back off from the challenge and suffered an even more spectacular accident than Villeneuve. When you watch the footage, do you see the same thing as me? You see a car that is crabbing around and just doesn't look right, that something inherently looks wrong with it. It just looks super stiff and just like, it, like you say, it does, it's not very... Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And I think that's probably part of the reason they both shunted in Eau Rouge. It just was either bottomed or was really stiff. Right. Um, but yeah, it's uh, caused them some headaches. <laughs> well, it's your headache now. Because you've well, got yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the wheels, the wheels fell off, it handled really badly, and it was too stiff, and it was this, and it was that. So now you've got one of these, and you've got a customer who presumably would rather it handled quite yeah. well, <laughs> yeah, and yeah, that absolutely. the wheel stayed on. So how do you go about sort of, you know, reinventing the wheel? I mean, with the joys for us is we're not, in a, we're not competing against other F1 teams, so you haven't got that same metric, which is good. And yeah. as you know, these things, even when you're way below the limit, are still quite incredible compared yeah. to 90% of the cars in the world. Okay. Um, so for us, we tune them back a little bit, we change the dampers so we have a lot more tunability. Uh, we can obviously afford to raise the ride height slightly, which, okay. which helps. So um, you can build in the compliance that makes them easy to drive and yeah, absolutely. less critical or likely to spit you into a barrier. Yeah, absolutely. And well, we, nice. we, we can manage any of those little issues, like the way that the brakes are mounted, and there's a lot of things that were designed to do just a Grand Prix. Yeah. We can go in and, and re-engineer those slightly to get more life into the car. That's cool. But it does look amazing. So there's some good looking stuff over here. So I know you're fond of Minardis, aren't you? Yeah, we, yeah we've so kind of... So can we go of... check it? Because nobody ever, you know, cared enough about the Minardis because they were there. Yeah. They didn't always, you know, finish. They didn't, yeah. al they didn't always get competitive, but we've got a bit of a relationship stuff. with them because we've done over the years have probably built one of every Minardi from the 80s all the way through to uh, the Alonso cars, 2001, yeah. um, all the way through to uh, the end. So uh, PSO5 would have been the last one, which was 2005. Um, so yeah, there's kind of like a affinity with it, but they are yeah. very Italian. Right, um, what does that mean exactly? They're, they're all quite pretty cars, but they're hard work. <laughs> and there's nothing for them. Obviously they were a small budget team. So there weren't tons and tons and tons of spares that you could try or pick knowledge out of. Right. Um, so, and no manual. No. And and again, the, this car, apart from one little piece of loom, uh, which would do the live telemetry, mm -hmm. is as it came out of Minardi in the end of '98. Every component. So you got everything. So unlike these ones where they they destroyed bits that they thought were yeah. sensitive, Minardi gave you the whole thing. Yeah. That's amazing. It, it came out and went to a private collection. Yeah. And then it sat still for a very long time. And then the new owner bought this two and a half years ago. Yeah. Um, and we relifed the car and got it back up and running. Then we've been doing events ever since. So this is it in winter prep now. It will go through this big preparation process. We do all the crack testing and the same thing that F1 teams would do. Um, relifing with the engine, gearbox, loads of other components. And then it'll go back together January, February next year. Awesome. So this one's completely original. Which yes. is brilliant. Yeah. All right, we've got another beast here, which looks like it's got a Honda engine. So it's got the original motor? It's, uh, it's actually a custom built. So again, Honda are the same as um, Renault would be. Just okay. destroyed them all. Right. Um, I'm sure they've got stacks of them in Japan somewhere, probably. Yeah. But getting them is, you know, unless you've been a Honda driver or you're part of Honda, it's not going to happen. So yeah. this owner, uh, this is a, a Cosworth again, yeah. um, but it has been built uh, for this car. So it's based on the same era engine. Okay. Um, 18,000 RPM. Okay, so this is one you're really proud of, because this is the one that you built. So this, you, you've yeah. got, with everything else, you've got to make up for everybody else's designs, and you thought, right, sod that, I'm gonna make my own car. Yeah, so this is our program. We, we, we've been doing the V10s, and I mean, we've done everything from the 50s all the way through to, to quite current. Um, and they, they can be prohibitive either in cash or people don't know that you can own them. Yeah. Um, and so this was built as a um, our own program that takes all the headaches of running these with the hydraulics, the high revs. I mean, these engines will do 400 kilometers and then they're toast. And then they've got to go- 400K? Yeah. And then they have to go back, full rebuild. 
and depending on the damage that can get very costly very quickly. Wow. Um, and that's provided they do stay together. Obviously, the V10 stuff was the Jud last difficult. longer, or yeah, the Jud will do um, two and a half thousand kilometers. Okay, like yeah. Obviously, designed for Le Mans, so yeah, uh, they they get the mileage. So this was this was born out of taking the difficult systems away, still providing a fully authentic F1 experience. Aerodynamically, the car is the same, but we do everything: electronics, engine, gearbox, yeah, um, all, all our own, uh, steering wheels our own, um, and we try and take all those difficult systems away. So this is. You know, you can run this with one mechanic. As long as you've got someone to strap you in, you can go and run it. All right, so the, one of the biggest cost savings must be in the motor. And this is tiny. It is. I mean, really, t what is that? It's so, tiny. So it is very loosely... This is an Audi. It's very loosely based on a, on a 180... You're um, kidding. ...Volkswagen engine. It's a so V-dub. Yeah, essentially. The, the very basis it's a golf. of that... Yeah, or a Mark 1 Audi TT. At the very, very basis, the block changes I like the way you talked it up to TT, but it's a Golf. Yeah, yeah. It's a 1.8 turbo. Yep, so it's 600 horsepower. When she's turned up, the car is about 700 kilos it's wet with me It's only got one turbo, it. even. Yep. Yeah. Um, and we warranty it for 3,000 kilometers. That's amazing. The, the entire powertrain engine and gearbox, which allows you to just go and smash the laps in and not worry about it. We have a deal with Pirelli yeah. um, and everything for these cars. As with all of it, we scan everything. Um, so we're starting to build this big database now, but this car, if it ends up in the fence, we can put it back together. As we made our way through the glory years of F1, it was perfect timing for James to show me another car he had tucked away in his cave of secrets. So, what is this now? We've got 2019. Race, yep. It's a racing point. Yep. It's massive. It is, isn't it? It's quite a step. Compared from, to everything else, this is absolutely huge. Yeah, from the V10 stuff, it's like a massive step, really. Yeah. When they were short, very light, nimble, these have gone the other way, where they've become really long. They're yeah. just a giant aerodynamic device. I mean, you look at this, they've, it, this is the, the, the thing that stands out is that the aero, everything, is taken to the nth degree. Yeah. Um, even the wing mirror is, sort yeah. of looks like it's really taking, <laughs> taking part in the whole show. But all these sort of small details, these little dive planes, and it's so complicated. It yeah. looks, you know, and any debris that hits that, it's going to have a massive effect on it, isn't it? Yeah, you can see, like, you don't see it on the TV, even the floor edges and the way they are, like, when they get touched and then the pace suddenly disappears in the race. It's yeah. like, oh, I don't know what the problem is, only banged wheels, you know, touring cars do all the time. But when you see what it loses to the car, yeah. you can kind of understand a lot more why, why they are like that. But even these wishbones are kind of shaped, they've got curvature in them that... Yeah, absolutely, so they're all in shrouds. So the centre of the wishbones are solid, and then these yeah. are all shrouds that can be changed to suit, obviously, different trims or different circuits. Yeah. Um, and then even the uh, adjusters for changing camber yeah. are all sealed, so there's no spaces. So this, this front end is quite controversial, isn't it? Yeah. What's the crack? So the, you, you know your game with this, because yeah. you used to work at Mercedes, didn't you? So yeah, yeah. In, what years were you there? I was earlier, so I was 2011, 2012, Rosberg, okay. Schumacher era. Yeah, this car is in, it's a 2019 car, it's in the 2020 livery. Yeah. Um, and it was dressed to be a 2020 show car for racing points. So the front wing is actually the 2020 fake Mercedes nose that's been adapted to fit the 2019 car. Oh, you don't mince your words with that then? No. So you, you, you said that that was copied from the I mean, Merc. that's what they, that's what the chat was with everybody. We know the car was very similar and the teams are very clever at being able to use imagery yeah. to scale and make components that look similar in the same way that teams have started heading towards the Red Bull. Right. You know, like Aston did this year and McLaren have gone that way as well. So, you know, there was never proven to be any transfer of info. One of the things you notice is, is where does the air go in? because the scoops are so small Tiny and it's so hidden. Um, so again, that's all making it more aerodynamic, just getting the air around, getting the flow faster through that rear wing. Yeah. Um, just, they're just demons, aren't they? So, so powerful and so, um, so much grip, it's ridiculous. Yeah. So what are you doing with this? This currently is the, it's the newest car in private ownership from a team, um, and we are looking at the Generation 2 TDF1 programme with this, so it will be back on track one yeah. way or another. Um, and we're going to use this as a development piece. So, you know, over the next 18 months, we'll develop this out, develop our powertrain for it. Yep. Um, and, and get it back on track. So you'll have a, a more modern car that's got um, yeah, all, more aero, more power, more grip, more everything. Yep, absolutely. What engine are you going to put in this then? Is that a trade secret? No, ongoing at the moment. Um, we've looked at a few programs, so there's an option to do our own powertrain from the ground up. Yeah. Um, potentially doing something that will mirror the V6. Okay. Um, so that we can keep it as a V6. Yeah. Um, but there are a few other options that we're looking at. But uh, yeah, that's going to depend on interest and the way we fund and that, that sort of step moving forward. The development phase is obviously yeah. quite big. Cool. Just need a track big enough to fit it. Yeah, you're, yeah, absolutely. Super cool. So obviously these race engines, thoroughbreds, pedigree, yeah. you know, built to withstand huge RPM, but also the, the contortions of the chassis. Yeah. 
So this this engine wasn't. So is, have you made a new block, or how, or how have you dealt with the the stress forces that are coming through the, the tub? So the block is is strengthened, is a slightly different block, um, and then we run these A-frames, um, okay. which gets our wheelbase back so the car operates in the same way that it did. Yeah. Um, it also means we've not adapted the chassis, so should the owner of this at some point decide they want to go back original, we can just unbolt our stuff and put the original componentry back in. So is this, this a Marusha? It was, yeah. Okay, from what year? 2011. Brilliant, okay, so you can, you can take your car here, if you bought one of these absolutely amazing pieces of kit, mm -hmm restore it in a way you want, so you can save the engine, the original, so you're not going to detonate it or risk it, put this in, but you can convert it back. Yeah, so we, so the TDF1 programme, we have owned all the cars, so the two salvers that are in reception, yeah. we've got uh, two other cars in storage. These are designed around that slight hypercar experience, you get yeah. to go and paint it the colours you want, as you can see with the livery on this car. Yeah. Um, and we've delivered the first three, we've got the fourth one in build now. Um, and it's just a different avenue, it kind of takes all the areas of the bits that we've learned over time and twist them into a sort of a different look at the uh, track market. I guess all the, I mean, you know, the OEMs have all gone track focused with mm. like the Valkyrie Pros and that kind of thing. We're trying to disrupt it by coming the other way with taking the ultimate race cars and making them usable on track and, and affordable, yep. but accessible to everybody. Okay, so how much does one of your TDFs set you back? I mean, what, if you want to... So these start at retail at 1.25. Okay. Um, and then the running cost is comparable to a GT3 car, or slightly less, depending on the mileage. Which has got to be, what, 50th of the original F1 running costs? Yeah, absolutely. And you can run this with one person? Yeah. That's uh, incredible. Presumably because the engine is so simple to start, because I know it takes about a team of yeah. 10 to fire up an, an, an original F1 engine with all the electronics. So that's much more simplified. Yeah. But you must have, have you, when you say you streamlined some of the really complex systems, mm -hmm. what stuff have you, is, do you mean the engine management the, the, and the steering wheel, is that the kind of electronics you've got rid of? Yeah, so that, like you say with the starting aspect, it's onboard starter, no yeah. offboard starts. Uh, it doesn't need preheat, um, it has got a preheat system, so you plug a battery and fire the car up, yeah. and then it runs through its own system in the steering wheel. It takes, you know, it depends how cold it is, but four or five minutes. Once it's warm, off you go. Um, it's all in pneumatics. Um, and everything is designed around ease of use. Um, and for us, the fact that we can carry the components and service the cars on site. Yeah. So when we do events in Abu Dhabi or when we're down in Melbourne, we can have an engine and gearbox in a box. Um, and if they have an issue, two hours, we can switch it and they'll be back out. Wow, okay. So it's How that. does it sound? That's the one thing that people always say because it's a four pot, but actually everybody listens to it and is like, okay, because it's noisy. It's obviously on a straight exit under the floor. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, I'll send you some footage, but yeah, it's, it's got its own tone about it. Still super noisy, um, but again, we can get around in some of the noise restrictions that we can't with these. What are my chances of you letting me drive one of these cars, <laughs> please? I mean, I think there's probably a fair chance. To really? Be fair. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Espe especially this program. But yeah. I think there's a couple of the V10s in here that when we get into shakedown into next year, that we might be able to do something. Epic. Okay, right. So, guys, please get on there on the comments. Help me out with this. I'm going to convince James to let me out in something. So, I'm going to pick, let you pick basically what is the best car for me to try and take out. I've got my own couple of favourites um, from my little tour, but um, I think we've got to lobby this one pretty hard and try and get in one of these next year. Um, thank absolutely. you for showing me around. No and, um, It'd be a lovely Christmas present to know that yeah. um, I'm going to get my hands on the merchandise in the new year. So Yeah, we'll have to get these guys to work out which one it's going to be. Right, bring it on. See you there. I've always been a massive fan of Williams F1 and Jack Villeneuve, partly because Gilles Villeneuve was one of my absolute heroes getting into racing in the beginning. Ayrton Senna, Gilles Villeneuve, very different styles, but very strong personalities. So to be sitting inside Villeneuve's car from 98, it's a really awesome sort of feeling. You feel that energy and that connection from a world champion. That 97 battle with Michael Schumacher that ended at Jerez, with Michael Schumacher being disqualified and Villeneuve hammering his way past in a really bold overtaking maneuver that really sort of personified what Jacques Villeneuve was all about. Villeneuve is all over him, look. He's going He's through. Still. Oh, yes. Oh. I don't think. Out goes Michael Schumacher. That didn't work. Very aggressive driver, very committed. 
bringing that sort of, if you like, that love of high speed cornering from the indie racing that he was so successful at, bursting into the Formula One scene with a pole position in his very first race, night six, which is just really unheard of. Only three drivers in history have ever been able to do that. So he came on as a dominant force and then won that championship in 97. A lot of bravery. And I just think that it's just so typical of his persona and the way he would tackle a corner like Eau Rouge. Absolutely no fear in fast corners. An Indy 500 winner wasn't going to have any fear for a track in Europe. So taking it flat out, OK, fair enough. But two years in succession to have a massive shunt like that. And this is a car that kept him safe and he hopped out the other side with a fairly glib comment. Because it's a big one uh, and you walk out of the car and you're not hurt. So it's, uh, you know, it's like when you get out of a big fight and you're the one who won. It's an amazing bit of kit. You can really sense all the engineering that's gone into this car. Absolutely epitome of F1. So the year after Adrian knew effectively, but you can still feel some of his touches, the raised leg position, which is something that was coming in through Adrian Newey as a way of packaging the car to make it aerodynamic. He fitted the driver into a smaller space by raising their legs. So it's a slightly unusual position, slightly light lying back in the car to get the driver out of the airstream, get the air to flow clean over this thing. But the vision out of these things is really limited. Basically, all you can see is your mirrors. You can't see your front wheels, you can't see the front wing. You're really in your own world, but that's what racing is like. You get into your little tunnel, you're very, very focused on what you're doing. And that's exactly how it would have felt for Villeneuve driving this car, absolutely rinsing every ounce of speed he could from it. Yeah, you've got some serious business done in this car. Maybe it's one that I'll be able to take out, we'll see. But I will keep nudging for that opportunity. I think it's fantastic that TDF are resurrecting these beasts, restoring them and getting them ready for what they were built for, the essence of speed, seeing them on track, live, in action. And if I'm very lucky, maybe I'll get a chance to try one of these very soon.